Welcome to the second episode of Diversity in Professionalism, a parallel series of the Rue Career Radio, the podcast dedicated to using our platform to talk about important topics and issues related to diversity in the hiring process, in the workplace, and in representation. My name is Daniel Folk, and I'm the Manager of Employer Development and Engagement at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I identify as a white, non-disabled male, and my pronouns are he, him. And I'm Taylor Mickle. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a white, queer, non-disabled counseling graduate student and also a graduate assistant in career counseling at UMKC Career Services. And we are your hosts for this episode of Diversity and Professionalism. Before we get started, let's get our housekeeping items out of the way. Use career services early and often for all of your professional development needs by making an appointment, attending a workshop, or going to career fairs. You can access all of this by heading over to Handshake. Just log in with your SSO. And of course, UMKC alumni still have full access to our services. Feel free to reach out via email anytime at careerservices at umkc.edu if you have any questions. And additionally, it is important to us to be transparent about our identities because they impact the ways we navigate the world and have these types of conversations. We do not claim to be the experts on topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that's why we will be bringing in guests to speak on their research and lived experiences in an effort to make progress towards better outcomes for our students, our listeners, and everyone out there. We will also be approaching this with a full understanding that we all come to this with certain privileges and with a mindset to learn and grow. In this episode of Diversity and Professionalism, we've asked Dr. Kevin Sansbury, an organizational consultant and behavioral scientist with Kevra Consulting, to discuss the importance of workplace culture, how it aligns with the values of the employees and its effect on their happiness. Dr. Sansbury, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. So I'm Dr. Kevin Sansbury, and I'm actually a, a RU alumni. I graduated with my MBA from UMKC. I got my doctorate, earned that uh, actually last year for University of Missouri St. Louis, so still part of the University of Missouri system. And uh, my focus is primarily on um, toxic leadership, uh, and specifically my dissertation focused on abusive supervision and how that interacted with employees facade creation related to values. And so I'm really happy to be able to speak with you all today based on my experience, not only in research, but in the field as a consultant with various firms in many different industries. So happy to be here. Thanks so much, Dr. Sansbury. So our topic today is organizational culture. And I think we all know that This is an important topic for everybody to be thinking about, but we also know that it doesn't affect everybody the same way. So could you start off by telling us a little bit about your experience with the topic, maybe some more about your research and your professional work in terms of organizational culture and its relationship to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Absolutely. Yeah. So part of the work that I've done professionally have been, you know, with consulting. And in consulting, I get brought in to do whether they're cultural resets or different projects related to uh, you know race equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that work has really you know transformed my research and the way I think because I I have seen the differential impact of the culture on people, and it's really sparked an interest in me of you know how do we disaggregate that data to look at what those differences are, um, and so they're not you know just based off of race or ethnicity or anything like that, but you see differences in, you know, how women show up in certain workplaces. You see differences based on age and things like that. And it's been really interesting because if you look at the the way the research talks about it on mass, you, you typically see, you know, best practices. And I'm one that likes I cringe when I hear that term sometimes because a lot of the best practices that you see in the research tend to marginalize a group of people. And a lot of people don't even ask that question of who is it marginalized, marginalizing it. So it's really important for, for researchers to be able to dig into those differentiated experiences, not to create some kind of caste system or anything like that, but to create solutions that really impact what you're trying to impact. 
Sure. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. So I think before it gets we get started, I think it would be helpful to kind of talk through what we mean when we say like toxic environments or even toxic leadership or supervision like you were talking about. So could you give us a couple examples of kind of what that looks like? Yeah. And, you know, t toxicity in itself is interesting. Um, coincidentally, my uh, podcast, the Toxic Leadership Podcast, just launched recently. And I speak with leaders about this very topic. And it's very interesting because one thing you'll find, even in the research, but you find in real life, is that some experiences, you know, two people can experience the same situation. But due to individual differences, they may interpret the environment differently. And so, you know, let's say you had a person in the workplace who had trauma in their past and, you know, people that raise their voice and yell and, you know, that abusive kind of leadership that exists in many places, that might trigger some folk, whereas somebody else could blow it off and just be like, you know what, I have the privilege not to, that doesn't affect me as much, you know what I mean? And I, I have that privilege, but then others, you know, struggle with that. And so that's my point about, you know, how we have to be able to differentiate that is because we all, whether we like to or not, walk around with our past. And a lot of people walk around with trauma with that past. And so with that being said, you know, my work in toxic, you know, leadership and toxic work environments is really about well-being. It's really about minimizing harm. So some examples of where you'll see behaviors uh, lifted up that are quote unquote toxic would be, you know, your typical abusive supervision piece that you, you'd see, but then you'd also see behaviors such as puppeting. Puppeting is a behavior that I've seen a lot of times where a leader would play behind the scenes, pulling strings and operating coups, you know, and like kind of, you know, doing things behind the scenes to control others. That's puppeting. I've seen freezing behavior. I'm, I'm upset with you. So I'm going to leave you off this email on purpose. I'm going to freeze you out of communication. And I'm going to freeze you out of job opportunities or extra growth opportunities. I've seen um, extreme forms of micromanagement become toxic for those who, you know, need autonomy or, or need trust in the workplace, which is, you know, it's like, is that too much to ask? I guess so sometimes. But I've seen extreme forms of, of micromanaging and things like that. And so, you know, when we talk about toxic work behavior, you know, one of the things I do, I just want to make sure is it can manifest in a lot of different ways. And it's not just the somebody slamming their fist on the table, somebody yelling, somebody, you know, you know, doing that kind of thing is not just that. You see a lot more psychological, you know, issue in the workplace and abuse in the workplace. And then secondarily, you don't see a lot of on the news, you'll see something like, oh, the toxic work environment on, you know, this show or the toxic work environment on this movie set and stuff like that. What's unfortunate is there are way more unreported toxic instances than reported. And so not every toxic work environment is going to be a sexual harassment claim or a discrimination claim. There are way, there are a lot, you know, the bell curve is really large on a, on a lot more things that are happening every day. And yet we really don't have any recourse for it in a lot of ways. You know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people, oh, it's not illegal to be a jerk. And it's like, yeah, I know that's not breaking the law, but you know, it should break something, you know what I mean? But a lot of times it doesn't. And these people remain employed for a long time. Um, wreak havoc. Just to that point, that can come from a boss perspective. That can come from my person in the cubicle next to me. Absolutely. And it, it's really hard as an employee to kind of avoid any type of those situations just because you have to be here every day. It's not always going to be COVID times where we're working from home. We might be in that cubicle again, not too in the not too distant future. So as, as career coaches, we frequently talk with students about workplace values, but I don't think it always really ever fully hits home until a student experiences it, until they're in a situation where they have to start thinking about this or, you know, really ultimately feeling it. So what should students uh, or job seekers in general be thinking about related to their values and what they need from a job before even starting the job search process? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer of the gig economy. I'm a big believer of the power of the people. And so what that means is I'm a big believer of before you apply for jobs, you, you kind of got to know what you want and you should stick to that and you need to be choosy. And and get off Glassdoor.com and trying to figure out what your salary is because sometimes it's inflated. So just be realistic about what prospects are, but be choosy about where you're going to spend your time because 
we all, you know, money's a thing, you know, everybody's attracted to money in some way, shape or form, but your mental well-being is priceless. And you, you have to understand that cost, you know, because your workplace, whether it's toxic or not, you know, you're paid for work, but there's a cost for you to work. So be mindful of where you spend your time. And so especially as we look at uh, individuals from a racial or ethnic minority background, gender identity, LGBTQIA, you know, just differences of the norm, quote unquote, because I don't believe norm. But as we think about differences of the majority, be aware of where you're, where you're going to work. So when we talk about values, what do you value? You know what I mean? It's harder to work at a place that doesn't align with your values and you're trying to force them into your value set. Unfortunately, what I see more of is a lot of people don't even know what they value because they value money first and they go take the first job that pays them whatever. And that actually morphs what they believe. And then they'll, I work with plenty of people around the country right now uh, as an executive coach, and they're having kind of some mental health issue or they're having some issue about pathfinding, meaning I don't know where to go next. I don't know who I am. That's a, that's a tough conversation to have when you're about to turn 40, when you're 46 years old, when you're mid-career. That's a hard conversation to have with somebody. My research uh, that I did, uh, and I did a TED Talk, and my TED Talk and my dissertation is entitled, The Masks We Wear in the Workplace Masquerade. And what I wanted to look at was the manifestation of us wearing this mask. And this is not COVID, like a COVID thing, before COVID, but the mask you wear, you know, you, you, you wear that mask of like who you are and you're like, I'm this person and I got this job and I wear this fancy, these fancy clothes and I'm this person. But in reality, you're probably like, let's say you're not, right? And you put these values on. And the, the literature derived from looking at, you know, from a gender standpoint, a race standpoint of like how people conform to norms that aren't necessarily theirs or even their culture or whatever, right? And they conform to that and they actually become someone else for power and privilege. And it happens every time. And so it's our, on our benefit, because, you know, the workplaces are designed to do what they're designed to do. That, like, that's, that's a fact. Systems are designed to get the results they get. And so with that being said, it's, it's the onus is on us as individuals to know what we value and know what mask we have on. And it's our choice to loosen the grips of that mask and take that thing off or, you know, that's who you are. And it's not, you know, you know and it's not that easy because I, I am aware that, you know, we have to make a living, but I'm on the camp of make a living. With the emphasis being on you have to live throughout all of this. Because is that, yeah, I mean, is, is being under that mask and hiding behind who you are and you get like a, a you barely get a Saturday and your Sunday's worried about Monday now. So like, that's living to you? Like, really ask yourself these questions and then times that by like 30, 40 years and then times that by any kind of, you know, racialized or gender, gender-based gender trauma that you may be experiencing, is that living to you? Because there is a different, there is another way. And as you were talking about that and thinking about those masks, we all wear masks at, at work to some extent, right? To At least to some extent. So me in this role, I portray being very organized, and that's because that's what my role required. But at home, I am very not that type of person. I am not organized. I'm not making five steps ahead. But that looks very different for someone from a marginalized group, right? They have to wear very different masks at the workplace. Well, and, and, and let me clarify that. So one having to adopt certain competencies for success and role is totally going to be a thing forever. That's like a thing, right? That's, that's just you fitting in the job, right? That's you meeting the competencies necessary for success in whatever job one has. Wearing a mask is, you know, you're being organized, but you have to do something dishonest for your work. And you're like, ah, I don't really, I, I don't, that don't sit well with me. That's not who I am as a person, but you have to go through with whatever that decision was that, that doesn't just sit right with you. And you being forced to conform to that, or you being forced to do that, like, that's where it gets really tenuous because now you're, 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 you're stepping on your value system. And so when I talk about facade creation, the facade really is you're adopting value systems that you truly don't believe in in exchange for whatever that, you know, gain you got, you know, so that's, so, I, so I'm glad you brought that up because I don't want people to think that like meet the expectations of your role or whatever is, you know, cause sometimes we get into a job that's not a good fit. I'm not an organized person, but I got to act organized. That's cool. You know? But that's, that's different than, that's more emotional labor. You can do that. 
that, that, that happens. So thank you, Daniel. So in terms of the masks that people wear at work, you talked before about having a life worth living and maybe wearing those masks or keeping the mask on being like antithetical to well-being in some cases. But I guess I just wonder for the folks who feel like for their safety or for financial or emotional safety, they have to keep that mask on. Like, is there any way that the mask wearing could feel sustainable or is it just ultimately it's not sustainable? Mm, That's a great question. Well, one of the things that I'm digging into now is the outcomes of this facade creation and digging into that, you know, a lot further. One of the things I've, I've, I've just come, come across and really uh, latched onto is the manifestation of something called self-deception. And based on your question you're asking, one, one may wonder, yeah, is self-deception sustainable? I don't think so. I believe we all have a, you know, we all know someone or have heard of some story where someone cracked under pressure and some, you know, they just couldn't hold it all up, you know, or whatever that is, too many plates spinning or whatever the terminology is. And so, no, I don't think it is sustainable because what you're going to see is that energy or that cognitive dissonance and what we call it has to get out somewhere. And what you tend to see is something called emotional projection. You know, so instead of them being upset at work and really sharing their true feelings about uh, uh, something, whatever it is, they instead do that with their spouse. And you see an increase in something called work family conflict or they are, you know, yelling at the dog. And nobody wants to yell at the dog. What are you yelling at the dog for? And so you, you see you do see that outlet come out. Here's here's the scary part. The body does keep score. So you also see that outlet come out parasomatically. And so you see that come out on your health. You see that come out on cortisol levels. You see that come out, your hair starts falling out. You can't sleep at night, your stomach issues. You have a rash and you're like, where does rash come from? And I'm, it's a stress rash, you know? You see that. There, so there's no way to hide it. There's no way to run from it. It's just important to know whether you deal with it or not, your body will as well. From a career counseling perspective, we look at values all the time and Within values, there's multiple things out there that show that values are the number one predictor of job satisfaction. They can pay you enough to ignore your values for a little while, but it's only a little while. There's no way you can be happy long term in a job that doesn't fit. I, I'm going to tell you, I've done a lot of surveys of like engagement, happiness and stuff. I've actually never seen salary the number one thing. I've never, I've never seen that. I haven't seen it in my work. And there's also that, that, you know, there's also that number people throw around and they say, oh, $75,000 is the happiness number or something like that. Like you don't feel happier after that, you know, and whether that's true or not anecdotally or, you know, in research or whatever, it says that's telling you something. Because I've never seen a study that said, hey, you could totally thrive and be at the top of your game if you have misaligned values or if you're in a toxic, you know, work environment, you can thrive. I, I, ain't, I have not seen that study. So if that study exists, I'd love to see it. But, I, but I've not seen that. I've also not seen, I've also not seen, hey, this is sensitive, this is a little soft, you know, just just deal deal with it and just do what you love on the weekend. Not seen that either. I've seen people try to fake that. I've seen people try to take adopt that for for some something. Go look at mental health rates in high stress roles and you know, and, and look just look at how that how that turns out long term. And so, sure, we are resilient as people, but really think about this in the long run. And like I said before, as we think about the the differentiated stressors, especially as it relates to being underrepresented in the workplace and in life, you got that on top of on everything we just talked about. So so you really have to think about again, don't allow chasing that paycheck to re-traumatize you. Um that that's really important to think about because it's not sustainable long term and if you know if you know something's not right in your gut, listen to that you know listen to that in- intuition you know it's very important um and and make that plan you know make that plan so one of the things I want to say is a lot of people that I coach it's not like, hey, you know we recognize there's a mismatch into this into my life into my work or what have you, and I'm gonna immediately just drop everything and really do what I need to be doing in life, but it's like make a plan you know make a plan of action uh because Making that plan of action is free, but actually sustaining that plan and putting it in action, that's where the time costs come in. That's where the risk comes in of changing your career. 
but you can always make a plan. And that, that planning process actually allows for the innovation and creativity to free yourself from those chains of paycheck or whatever that is, those golden handcuffs. That statement is the perfect transition into the rest of our topics are really the practicality side of things. What do we need to be thinking about? So, you know, as we think about practical steps, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've worked with some folks on very, very real and very live is A, know your values because your values become your shield. Your values become what you defend yourself with because a lot of times in these situations, especially for women and underrepresented minorities, is there's this impact that, that tends to happen where you feel like you're the crazy one in the room. You feel like you are like totally out of whack. And you're like, you know, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, whatever the difference is. Let's say the difference in the workplace is I'm a minority based on my L, I'm L, LGBTQIA plus or gender minority, racial and ethnicity, whatever that difference is and you have a different perspective than the masses and you share it, you will sometimes get into a situation where you feel like you are just off. You're like, okay, maybe it's me. And that gaslighting effect is very real. And so that's why I say, you know, identify your values because those become your shield and those become things you attach yourself to and your principles as to why you think and do the you know things you do. And, and be honest about, look, you know, I value transparency. I value this. I value not getting yelled at, you know, whatever that may be. I mean, it's like, there's some pretty low bars I'm setting here, but um, whatever that may be, you, you set those, you set that and that's what it is. And I believe in giving, giving grace, you know, so give grace to others as things happen. Cause no, you know, nobody's, no, nobody knows what your values are either until you, until you start saying it. Right. So give others grace to make mistakes, but don't make your life a slew of mistakes being made upon you because you have to make a choice right so 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 then name of the game there is what does your social network look like what are your you know where are your influencers that you know that organizations you might want to work for or people you want to work with because guess what your next interview you'll become so much more confident because you are it's courting now it, it's not just i'm begging for a job it's you are interviewing them too and now you know what you, you are not going to stand for because you have a principled shield that you can stand behind. And so you have to know all of that. And then related to like realistically doing the transition piece, um, I always, you know, tell people to ensure that you have a certain level of savings and survivability related because that's just a practicality for anything. But if it comes a time where your health takes a decline, and you need to get out of that environment, you need to be able to do so whatever, in, in whatever time interval you can. But Because a time inter interval is better than no time interval. So if, if, if one had three months saved up to, to do that escape, or if they literally had a, a health crisis due to stress or whatever, and now they don't have anything to do, like it's better to have something. And so having, having some kind of financial buffer is helpful. But again, utilizing your uh, network that you have, uh, you, know, you might know a recruiter, you might know somebody that works somewhere else that can help you find pro job prospects a lot faster. And then going down the list of practicality, if you can't find the organization that works for you, start one yourself. Um, I'm a big believer of you know, entrepreneurship and I'm a big believer of providing you know, for your own. And, and so even if you have a job, like I'm, I'm all about the gig economy because that's a form of freedom especially for a lot of women and underrepresented minorities and things like that. You know, that's a, that's a form of freedom for a lot of people. And so I really, I really feel like whether you make $10, $10,000, $100,000 on the side or whatever that may be, do it. Because you never know, that might one day be your vehicle. Yeah, I love what you said about using those values as kind of like your shield and, and the thing that you always come back to. I think that's really helpful. So for folks who maybe aren't ready to take that step into entrepreneurship and are still kind of, you know, pursuing opportunities with existing organizations, do you have any thoughts on how to kind of get a feel for the company culture and what the experience is going to be like to hopefully avoid some of those experiences of toxic work environments? Yeah. And so one, one step I wanted to make sure I mentioned was, let's say you didn't even want to leave the current situation. One thing I always tell people, and no matter what is, speak your piece and address the situation, whatever, you know, wherever that source is, whatever that source may be, coworkers, supervisor, you know, direct report, address the source. 
because one thing I tell people is if you if you address the source, at least I mean, whatever the consequences may be, at least now you know where they sit and where they stand. I mean, you know, at least you now you know. You know, you know how they're gonna show up. So like you now have a complete picture because a lot of times what like I told you before, the uh the toxicity sometimes may be heightened based on your personal trauma too. And so a good way to check if you if you gaslighting or not, you know, address it, express it, and see what happens. Because at least now you know. And so if things get worse for you, you, you hey, look at that. Look at that, you know? If you're if you're if you're met with compassion and behavior tends to change, look at that. And I've seen both. So back to the question of, you know, how do you gauge what the culture is like uh, in a, at another company? One of the things that's helpful, we do have, I mean, we're, we have everything at our fingertips now. So obviously there are, you know, there are resources like to go, to go look at sites, employees ratings of a, of a website and stuff like that. But you have to be mindful that, uh, you know, survivor bias. And uh, with that being said, you have to be, you have to ask yourself the scientific questions like, okay, maybe only the people who would rate a certain way decided to rate, or maybe the data is manipulated some way because of, you know, people want to look good, optics and things like that, because you hear stories of all that kind of stuff. So one of my most true to life recommendations is, A, if you know someone at an organization, just talk to somebody you know. You can, if you're like, I don't know anybody, go through like your career services, go through like your handshakes, your alumni networks, try to, I mean, you, at universities, you can find people that work basically anywhere, right? And so try to find connections that way, because, hey, the commonality, we're both rules. And, you know, we, we both can like, let's, let's say, let, can I, can I talk, talk with you? Things like that. If you don't have that resource at hand, you could also look on LinkedIn and reach out to folks. You know, if they work at a, if they work at a company you want to work for, or better that better yet, you can also talk to people who used to work at that company. Hey, how was your experience? I, you know, I'm just, I'm just really curious. I just graduated. I'm really curious, you know, and I always, you know, always, you know, I always recommend the folks you know, hey, I, I like I like your career progression, and you seem to love this company. Tell me what you think about it. What should I what should I get, what should I know for getting myself into it? And again, your biggest antenna is your gut. And so, when you get into these situations, trust it. You, you know, it keeps you safe. And so, fi find out again, find out your values, and find out all the data you can on that organization through whether it's alumni networks, people you know, people that used to work there, people you don't know, because at the end of the day. It, networking's fine. You're building relationships. So build relationships anyway. For sure. And I know I missed the bus on this topic, but whenever you were talking about values and it being your shield, you also mentioned that you were setting the bar low with some of those values that you were throwing out with, you know, just taking care of myself. But it's it's surprising how how low we need to start that bar in just building a vocabulary around values. Whenever I ask students to name some of your values, some of your career values, I get one or two. And and being able to build that vocabulary, at, you said set the bar low, but I think we need to, and just to just to start raising that bar and to get that to the forefront of the mind as we are job searching, as we're starting this process, because career that's one of the biggest decisions of our lives so yeah yeah and i mean i i think with your values you need to set the you need to set the bar on what's right for you but when you when but when a lot of people think about the workplace some people have low a low bar they're like oh um or or, or they, they'll have a thing where like yeah i don't i don't mind if people take my steal my ideas i don't mind that and i'm like oh okay wow you know like like so don't so don't don't set the bar where you're getting taken advantage of because if you care about something, you care about something. So care about it, <laughs> you know? So, so for me, yeah, I think, you know, as we think about our values, really the central question, the, the central question, I could have just said it, what do I value? But no, the central question as it relates to like the toxicity piece is how do I want to be treated? How do I deserve to be treated? And like, if you think about it like that, that, that kind of takes your value into a different, a different kind of area. And so, you know, find, find your treatment values or whatever, you know, like find how you deserve to be treated because at the end of the day, that, that's what you, that those are your, those are you expressing your needs, right? Because we all bring a certain genius and a certain gift, all 8 billion of us or however many of it is around here, but we all bring something. But if we don't respect ourselves enough to vocalize how we need to be treated for our success and for us to thrive, we're not doing ourselves a service. And we're actually not bringing our best self to that workplace anyway. 
and knowing the value that we bring, like putting a value to that, not just it, when you're just doing the job every day, you're in it, You, it's hard to look, step back and see the accomplishment for what it is. So putting a value to what you bring to an organization, that's one of the big kickers too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And some of the, you know, some of the, some of the research that I, that I did, I had, I had asked why people don this mask at work. That was one of my qualitative questions. And it was fascinating that at the end of the day, whether it was due to, they had a different religion than the rest of the group, political affiliations, racialized standpoint, you know, whatever that difference was. One thing I will say that came out from the qualitative data is a lot of people thought they had to wear a mask to maintain relationships, which that was, that was kind of like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, no, we want to be able to create and we should want to create organizational cultures that are not based in, you got to adopt these values for you to fit in this culture. And that's what I was reading in my research. True belongingness is whoever you are in this 8 billion people earth. And I might, that never might be up. I looked at it when I was like in the eighth grade or something. But like whoever, whoever you are on this earth, you belong. And so we want to know who you are. We want to know what you bring to the table. I don't care if it's vastly different. I want to see how we can leverage that. that. So when you look at the word inclusion and belongingness, like that's how you truly get to the level I'm talking about. But I think a lot of people love to read books about anti-racism or feminist literature. And we like to espouse things and sound smart, but we don't really want to put it into action in real life. And I think that's what tends to happen in a lot of workplaces. And to be honest, I, I tell a lot of people, you might as well just speak the truth. <laughs> you might as well just say you don't want an inclusive work environment. Just say that. Because at least, at least, I mean, from a transparency standpoint, at least I know who you are. It's, it's worse if I'm led to believe something and I t you, know, you take the mask off and then I'm harmed because now you're just perpetuating trauma. Let's say I do put on that mask of persona or even cover up something. So I change my hair. I change the way I dress, the way I portray myself for an interview. I get the job. I'm in. When can I be myself? I, I would ask the question, who told you you couldn't do it in the interview? Because think about it. You did it in the interview. So guess what? You've already lost. You've already played that game. So do it. In, I was, I, so my hair is longer than it ever has been. And I grew it out in a period in my life where I was like, you know what? It's funny how like, an interview is always our bar of like, how should we, how should we look in life? And this uh, interview, like, that's crazy. Right? First off, first off. But my hair was a thing. Why, why am I thinking about a job interview when I'm deciding on how I want my hair to look? Why, like, I literally had, but that's my thought. In 2016, when I started growing my hair, that was my only thought. Oh, I'm never going to get hired like this. That was my thought. And that's, that's crazy. And so my standpoint on appearance and on all of that is if you come to an interview and that kind of stuff nails you out of the job or something like that, you actually didn't belong there in the first place. Beautiful. I love that. I think that's so helpful to hear, especially from, you know, someone who's done so much work in this area. I think, you know, a lot of students have that question, like, you know, is it okay if I like put my pronouns on my resume or is it okay if I look this way or act this way in an interview? I think that's a big concern. So I think that's really helpful. One thing I wanted to learn a little bit more about, you talked earlier about, you know, this, this idea of, of transparency and kind of how disappointing or, or hurtful it is when, when you have sort of been led to believe one thing about the culture and then you learn that that's not the case. So I wonder just with so many organizations using diversity, equity, inclusion as like buzzwords, you know, especially during the interview process, especially to bring in new candidates, how do we suss out like how real that is? You know, look at how they... <laughs> Look at how they talk about it. One of the things that I, I always look at is like, you know, their diversity and inclusion is like a project or a program or an initiative or a strategy or strategies. Like, like look at how they talk about it. Because to me, the, w the way I look at, you know, any of that work or any social, it's, this is about people. So it's social justice, it, whether we like it or not. So anything about social justice is, are we talking about it for real, for real? Or are we just trying to look good? based on protests that are occurring in our country, based on the death that is occurring on our country from many populations, um, that are we just trying to play safe face? 
Look at what they were doing five years ago. You know, look at where they're going. If a, if an organization, the majority of people of color are actually the DNI department. Look at that. That's something. You know, and also look at. You know, it's one of those things of look at how they do their work and how they shifted their work. So here's an example. Like here's an example I'll give you. So let's say I'm a company, and I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, we 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 believe in Black Lives Matter now. So we're gonna donate like one percent of our so our product or whatever or money to start this program and yay. But yet our actual product harms communities of color. But we're gonna keep this product going and we need to, you know, shove this down their throat or whatever, the food or whatever. You know, like like you, you have to you look at what they're doing. So it's kinda like it, it's kinda like, hey, we we pollute all over the world, but hey, we built this park over here, but we're gonna dump all this stuff in a lake, in the lake at the park. Like so you can tell if something's corporate social responsibility or if something's truly embedded in the organizational's framework and DNA. You'll be able to tell because some things won't sit right. And I'm a big believer of giving grace, like I said before. And so let's say you're in that, let's say you're in that company. And you're like, you know what? We're not going far enough, fast enough or whatever. That's going to be a feeling. Temper expectations because it take like companies take a while to change who they are. Companies take a while to shift. And so I believe I'm a big believer in companies being on a journey. I think people use that vernacular. Um, we're on a journey. Da, 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 da. I'm a big believer in that. But at the end of the day, you can have a map in your hand telling you we're on a journey or I can have a map and at least I know we're walking. So don't try to tell me we're on a journey. You're actually walking in the opposite direction or standing still. Take one step. Show me that one step. Show me that second step. Show me what you're really doing. And at least let me know you know this is messed up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you could tell me, you know, I know, you know, it could be like, I know we're polluting that lake. Like that example, I know we're polluting the lake. Here's what we're doing to not pollute the lake anymore. And I know we're losing a little bit of profit, you know, and I know business, I know, you know, shareholders and stuff, but hey, this is what we're doing to, to counteract the profit loss because we really believe in what we're doing. You know what I mean? Like we really believe in this and this is what we're doing differently, but we're not there yet. We're not going to be there. We might not be there in 10 years, but here are the steps we're doing to, to make a true change because we really believe in this. That would sit a lot better than that same company that's polluting that lake or whatever saying, oh yeah, we're all in. And they add a few black people to their website and then they market in and they write a statement on killings in a country and still they're gonna pollute the lake. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're still gonna do whatever they were doing that was horrible or whatever, you know? Like, I, I, I actually don't want all that. Don't send me no email. Don't, I don't care what your statement is. If you're still doing that, if I don't see any tangible steps to walk backwards from what you're doing, you might as well just keep doing it. That's the like that's the literal definition of like window dressing. And I don't think people have time for window dressing. We are a very one thing I'll tell job seekers is you know the for, for the COVID and there have been a lot of layoffs. I've actually helped some people you know from a layoff standpoint find find employment during this year past year. And there are, there are a lot of there are a lot of openings and there are a lot of seekers. But to be honest, based on the amount of remote jobs that are increasing and the amount of information we have at our fingertips and an amount of things you can learn for free this is a this is a, per, a person heavy market you know and you can make you know you can kind of create that destiny based off of all the things we have at our disposal nowadays candidate candidate driven market driven market i guess i would say so own it in summing up in conclusion in thinking about all of this what do you see as positive trends that we're moving toward in the hiring process and in workplace management we're having these types of conversations. Um, if you look back, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't invited to speak about these types of topics for my entire career. And over the past two years, I have been, <laughs> you know, tremendous, a tremendous amount of time to be able to share my research, being able to speak about these issues very deeply, especially being able to highlight the differential impact as it relates to, you know, gender and underrepresented minorities, which again, people didn't want to talk about it like that before. And so I think being able to have these conversations and being able to really speak this truth to spaces that probably wouldn't think in this way three years ago, one year ago, six months ago. Um, and I, so, so I say that is the big win because I'm going to be frank, the stuff people are doing right now and the stuff organizations are doing right now are great, but let's talk in five years. Let's, let's talk in 10 years. You know, let's look at, I look, again, what's our long term sustainable solution and not just you know one time throw some money at something so you can praise us on the internet and give us the likes what's our long-term sustainable change 
And that's really what we need to look for as it relates to these organizational culture initiatives. And that's really what we need to look at as we look at, you know, counteracting toxicity that operates in the workplace. And we appreciate having you. Thank you, Dr. Kevin Sansbury, for coming. We greatly appreciate it. Do you have any closing remarks that you would like us to know that you want us to leave with? Yeah, I mean, I invite everybody to engage with me on the Toxic Leadership Podcast. You can find me on the toxicleadershippodcast.com or find me on LinkedIn. I really would appreciate any engagement. And there are, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for people to, you know, break bread with and, you know, have, you know, converse about their stories in the workplace. Um, because that's really, the more we speak about these topics, the more it becomes less taboo, because that's important. You're not alone. Um, you're not weak. You're not gaslighted. You know, you're fully whole. And I want to be a part of that journey. I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Sansbury. I feel like I've learned a lot and this is I think for me and, and hopefully for the people listening to been helpful in, in putting my own experiences into perspective. So I really appreciate you. And learning opportunities for moving forward as well. So from our listeners, from everyone, thank you. We appreciate it. That is it for this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and our YouTube channel, UMKC Career Channel. We encourage you to join our LinkedIn group created for UMKC students, alumni, and employers to connect, post positions, and get updated on career prep info, tips, and tricks. This has been Diversity and Professionalism, a parallel series to Rue Career Radio, brought to you by UMKC Career Services and Block Career Center. See you next time.